to the panelists and the members of the audience who are graciously joining us tonight or today or this morning, depending on which side of earth you're joining us from, I welcome you to Korea Futures webinar, Torture and Cruel, Inhuman or Degrading Treatment or Punishment Experienced by North Korea's Religious Minorities. My name is Injung Wang, a project investigator at Korea Future, and I am going to be the moderator for this event. This webinar is graciously sponsored by Stephanus Alliance International, an independent human rights organization with a special focus on the right to freedom of belief and religion for all, as expressed in Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Since 2019, Korea Future has been documenting cases of religious persecution within North Korea by recording and analyzing the testimonials of North Korean defectors currently residing in South Korea. Our investigations have revealed that North Korea's claim of upholding religious freedom within its sovereign territory is built upon the autocratic state's maintenance of an impression of religious freedom by, so, <clears throat> through state funding of simulacrous churches and temples in tourist-friendly locations open to foreign visitors. In communities, villages, and cities close to foreign visitors, the North Korean government engages in the systematic oppression of all forms of religious practices through its law enforcement entities. Among religious traditions effectively outlawed by the North Korean state, native shamanic practices and Christianity remain the primary victims of state-sanctioned ideological persecution and judiciary violences. Although Christianity and shamanic practices are distinct components of North Korean economic, cultural, and spiritual landscape, their adherents are apart from public manifestations of their faith in fear of, among other violations of international law, torture and cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. Many of our interviewees lived as practitioners of shamanic beliefs and Christianity in North Korea, and were able to provide us with accounts of religious oppression in North Korea based on their personal experiences. Both shamanic and Christian adherents testified to religious practitioners arrested by law enforcement officers who failed to present valid warrants or inform the detainees of the criminal charges they're facing. A judiciary practice all too common in North Korea. Once detained, religious adherents were exposed to inhumane conditions that severely encroached their basic rights to food, rest, and even basic personal hygiene. Throughout the course of their interrogations, the adherents were subjected to both physical and psychological forms of torture designed to both extract unwilling confessions and enforce inhumane levels of inmate discipline. Detained religious adherents were sentenced to years of forced labor in penal facilities without being granted access to fair trials involving unbiased tribunals and appropriate legal representations. Witnesses even testified that shamanic and Christian adherents faced additional physical violence and verbal assault by both law enforcement officers and prison guards who harbored active animosities against any forms of religious beliefs. Select witnesses have also testified to summary executions of Christian practitioners by firing squads or indefinite incarceration of Christian adherents within political prisoner camps. Today, we launch a new report and video to coincide with this event. Our report, which is also titled Torture and Cruel, Inhuman or Degrading Treatment or Punishment Experienced by North Korea's Religious Minorities, finds that the North Korean government is failing to protect its citizens from torture and other ill treatment handed out by North Korean public officials. Not only is there an absence of effective legislative, administrative, and judicial measures to prevent actual torture, but religious persons in particular experience severe forms of torture, including physical beating, positional torture, and denial of food and sanitation. However, we should recall that North Korea is not immune from international law and justice nor should North Korea's victims be divorced from the remedies and redress to which they are entitled. As such, what happens inside North Korea is relevant globally. To discuss these and other issues are our speakers today. 
Chan Shim Li is an investigator at Korea Future. She has a background in international law and has undertaken many interviews of survivors, witnesses, and perpetrators of religious freedom violations in North Korea. Timothy Cho is the inquiry clerk to the United Kingdom's all-party parliamentary group on North Korea, also known as the APPG. The APPG on North Korea was established to formulate solutions that promote and support human rights, democracy and security in North Korea and to establish relations with the exiled North Korean community to foster understanding of North Korea and the challenges which face its people. Timothy was born in North Korea and experienced both the denial of freedom, religious freedom and crimes against humanity. Next, we have Dr. Nora Sveas, who is an expert in human rights and psychological consequences of torture and violence. She is a professor of psychology at the University of Oslo and a specialist in clinical psychology. She worked as a senior psychologist at the Psychosocial Center for Refugees at the University of Oslo, served as a member of the United Nations Committee Against Torture and United Nations Subcommittee on Prevention of Torture. She has received many awards, including the Human Rights Prize for, of Amnesty International Norway. Next, we have Dr. Juliana Monina, who is a senior researcher and project manager at the Ludwig Volsmann Institute of Fundamental and Human Rights. Her research and consulting focus on human rights, especially the prohibition and prevention of torture and ill treatment under the UN Convention Against Torture and its Optional Protocol. She provides trainings, lectures, and presentations on the prohibition of torture and ill treatment, the right to, of liberty and security, and the right to a fair trial. It is our hope that today's webinar will provide contextual, nuanced perspectives on North Korea's religious persecution that could inspire fruitful discourse on future human rights efforts to help ensure freedom of religion within North Korea. To avoid confusion, we kindly ask that everyone except the person on the floor to mute their microphones throughout the duration of the event. Thank you. We will now first hear from Hyun Shin Lee. Jim, the floor is yours. Thank you, Inje. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Hyun Shin Lee, and I am a project investigator at Korea Future. Uh, let me share the screen first. Yeah. So today I will speak about uh, documented cases of torture uh, and cruel, inhumane or degrading treatment, in short CID, uh, that have been perpetrated against North Korea's religious minority. The right to be free from torture and CID is a use cogens of international law, the Universal Declar Declaration of Human Rights, the International Covenant, on civil and political rights and the Convention Against Torture all prohibit the use of torture and it cannot be infringed under any circumstances. In cases where such an offense occurs, states, states also have an obligation to take necessary measures to ensure appropriate penalties for such offenses. What does torture mean? The definition of torture can be found in Article 1 of Convention Against Torture as any act by which severe pain or suffering, whether physical or mental, is intentionally inflicted on a person for such purposes as obtaining from him or a third person information or a confession, punishing him for, for an act he or a third person has committed or is suspected of having committed, or intimidating or coercing him or a third person, or for any reason based on discrimination of any kind, when such pain or suffering is inflicted by or at the instigation of or with the consent or uh, acquiescence of public official or other person acting in official capacity. It does not include pain or suffering arising only from, inherent in, or incidental to lawful sanctions. The right to, free, the right to freedom of religion or belief is a fundamental principle of international law that shares a normative basis with the right to freedom from torture and CID. Enshrined in international human rights treaties, the right to freedom of religion or belief protects all individuals, including those who hold non-theistic and atheistic beliefs. The right to form, to adopt, 
and to change belief cannot be violated under any circumstance and limits on the freedom to manifest a religion or belief may only be applied through lawful means when necessary to protect public safety, order, health, or the fundamental rights and freedoms of others. Critically, the right to freedom of religion or belief does not protect or privilege any religious or belief system uh, under international law it protects individuals, not religious or belief systems, including those who hold non-theistic and atheistic beliefs. Evidence gathered by Korea Future established the physical and psychological forms of torture in CID has been perpetrated by a North Korean public official against members of religious minority. The prolonged denial of food and sanitation physical beating and positional torture were most prominent and were intentionally inflicted to in intimidate and punish religious persons and to obtain confessions or information. Further, CID was enabled by the poor conditions of penal facilities that incited further harm. In every documented case, the, re the religious adherence of the victims was considered to be fundamental to the documented violations. North Korea's government has not acknowledged the use of torture and CID by its public officials. It has not taken steps to prohibit the use of torture, nor to enable justice for victims and hold perpetrators to account. It has rejected allegations of torture and CID in a 2014 United Nations Commission of Inquiry report. And despite being a state party to international human rights treaties that prohibit torture, including the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the government of North Korea has failed to fully engage with the findings of international communities in relevant treaty bodies and fora. I will now briefly describe uh, some of the most commonly documented forms of torture and CID throughout our investigation. Uh, these are the deprivation of food, the denial of sanitation, physical beating, and positional torture. We'll look into each form of torture and CID to better understand what it means for persons arrested and detained for their religious beliefs in North Korea. Persons who had been arrested and detained on the grounds of their religious or belief identities commonly experience prolonged starvation, the periodic deprivation of food, and associated health consequences, including malnutrition. The consequences of the prolonged and periodic denial of food showed bodily weakness, loss of body tissue, and skeletal appearance. Provision of pebbles and grains of sand as food materials were common, as well as rotten corn kernels. Many interviewees testified that it was hard for them to eat such food at first, but they ended up eating them after several days because they were starving. The amount of food was not adequate to maintain one's health nor was the food safe to consume. The, the denial of food was widespread and it was exceptional to find cases where detainees were provided with safe food in adequate portions. In that regard, documented cases show detainees suffering from malnutrition, which led them unable to walk by themselves upon their release. The denial of sanitation refers to the denial of the right to enjoy the highest attainable standard of physical health and mental health, according to ICESCR. The World Health Organization defines sanitation as access to and use of facilities and services for the safe disposal of human urine and feces. This not only applies to every human being, but also to prisoners. The UN standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners calls upon the state's responsibility to ensure detainees with access to sanitation. Documented cases in North Korea was very far removed from what the requirements of international standards. The conditions of cells were poor in general. Lice infestation was so common that it was frequently noted that detainees were not able to sleep at night as the lice were crawling their faces, and so many of them were in their clothes that they had to burn all the clothes they wore upon their release. Regardless of the severe lice infestation, there were no measures taken to eradicate or prevent further infestation by the North Korean authority. On a side note, as you can see on the image, the entrance to the cell is very small, which is about a meter high. So, 
people have to crawl into the cell like a dog. This is also an indication that amounts to the CID. Also, victims had to undergo shame from open defecation, defecation, an inability to wash one's body or clothes during one's detention, and the denial of sanitary pads for women. In, my, in many documented cases, female detainees had to rip one of their clothes to make their own sanitary pads without, e without being able to pro properly wash them. The physical beating of a person with fist, fit, or object as forms of corporate punishment can amount to forms of torture and CID. Uh, in North Korea, victims were faced with immediate physical beatings upon their entry uh, into penal facilities. Physical beatings involved acts like acts of striking or kicking a person with fists or feet, either in a systematic or prolonged way or in a random act of violence. Striking a person with objects including sticks, rifles, steel rods, electrical discharge buttons, and a wooden club called osungogakja. Having detainees' hands out of the steel bars, stepping on the hands with boots, or striking their upper hand with sticks were commonly found from our investigation. <clears throat> and there were documented cases of crushing where a victim's head was smashed against a solid object such as steel bars or into a wall physically uh, by a correctional officer or his commander. Positional torture is manifested through forced sitting, forced standing, for squatting and forced immobilization in a cage. These acts target a victim's tendons, joints, and muscles. Commonly, victims were forced to remain seated and cross-legged on the floors of the cells for most of the detention. Uh, because victims were forbidden from moving and talking in any circumstances, many victims uh, testified that it was better to be called, up, called for interrogation which was the only time victims were free from sitting in a fixed position. Of course, victims were subjected to physical beating uh, within a cell and in front of other detainees if they slightly moved. As a result of pre previously mentioned forms of torture in their detention, uh, victims had physical and psychological consequences of torture, such as bleeding, bruising, swelling, open wounds, lacerations, and vomiting in a short term, scars, skeletal deformities, back pain, incorrect healing of fractures, somatic complaints, and depressive disorders in a longer term. This indicates the failure of the North Korean government to prohibit any, any use of torture or CID against religious adherents and to make any effective measure uh, to hold the perpetrators accountable. It only suggests that the torture and CID is widespread and that is targeted at religious adherence in detention by public officials across multiple penal facilities and under different commands. As an immediate priority, the failure of the North Korean government to prohibit the use of torture and other forms of CID against religious adherence confers a responsibility upon the international community uh, through UN and in coalition to pursue accountability strategy that targets the most those most responsible. Uh, this approach must be sustained and inclusive of national and international justice actors, civil society organizations, and survivors. Uh, this was our finding from our investigation, and I'd like to give, give the floor to Timothy, if I believe. The floor is yours. Thank you. Whew, that was not easy. Even we, we don't have that experience just listening to it. It's quite tough, isn't it? Each yeah, subject, it actually deeply going into the skin to feel it. I mean, this is a, in part of uh, uh, my personal own experience links to as well. But it's not just me. And, and probably we can ask all North Korean SKPs or even people who are remaining who are also still are going through or such as this kind of experience on daily basis or weekly what's happening right now. Let me start with this, a, uh, a Northern teenage boy who uh, I know 
he was once arrested at the China and Mongolian border during his escaping journey to a, a democratic society. And after his detention at Manchuria and Tumen uh, uh, um, prisons, which is around uh, uh, close to the North Korean border, and he was then repatriated to North Korea. Um, he, 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 he can imagine what fear he was holding in arriving in North Korea, which he tells was that the police first asked the group of each person if anyone has been to church, met foreign missionaries and prayed in China. This is very, very common question. I think uh, uh, Korea Future Initiative uh, probably have had many interviews and uh, North Korean escapees, they probably have said the same answers and same context of what they first come to ask you when they return to North Korea. And in this group, everyone of course said no, knew what consequences would come. But when the same question came one more time, one guy actually confessed that he had been to a church in China. Well, at that moment, the policeman was beating him uh, mercilessly with the handcuff uh, on his head. The blood was streaming uh, from top of the head. And this teenage boy, he was very, very trembling that moment. And he even peed on his pants actually that moment. And that story actually is mine which when I was a teenage boy and uh, how I was uh, experienced myself very patriots in North Korea when I was arrested at the Mongolian border. And this was my beginning experience to see what was happening inside North Korean prisons. Probably, uh, probably all North Korean escapees claim the same context that uh, it still remains one of the worst nightmares and flashbacks until this moment. As from time to time, I still experience going back to hearing prison inmates screaming and begging for survival. And it's because I just put these some nice words, but what was happening unspeakable act of inhumanity happened in front of me and in front of North Korean escapees when they returned and sent back to North Korea. Certainly prisons in North Korea are not silent, not at all. Just let me uh, explain about one prison uh, where I was detained and probably hundreds of, hundreds of prisoners and around 50 people were crammed in my prison cell actually. The guards and forced to sit on the floor the entire time. But there was obviously not enough space to lie down. So what we did, we were back to back and support each other and at night and day have to be just like that. And, and one other inmate uh, who was sitting just behind of me, he died during the night and perhaps the cause of death and, and torture, starvation, illness. And we mentioned about, uh, uh, Hyunjin was explaining about what food was given uh, to these detainees. And my experience was there only two scoops of noodle soup each day. And with that, I carry on investigation harshly. And if someone walked back in the, uh, in the cell, uh, it's lucky, but usually someone had to help them to get him back to the cell. And even a lack of medical care, as you can imagine what's in there. And so the person's death caused could be uh, all of the above, torture, starvation, illness, lack of medical care. And his dead body, and when two policemen came and dragged him out, uh, he, if he were like a dead animal, and I'm sure this is quite common text from North Korean SKP to how they often drugged out when someone if he killed or dead. Prisoners certainly are not humans in North Korea. And as a young boy, I did, I saw uh, the death of starvation and public execution on the streets and at the train stations. As a teenager, when I was in, in North Korean prison cell and the prisoner behind me died, this was certainly a shocking experience. When I, <laughs> I mean, we have a number of experts in here, which I'm not going to highlight anything about the international charters. But when I look at this subject of torture and inhumane treatment in North Korea, I think I, I also want to highlight that it's not only about outside the torture scars and as myself carry and other North Korean SKP's bodies, but this it, it also goes on both inside and outside the scars remain very deeply and if he's not physical, 
Yeah, uh, and many millions of families experience this ongoing and suffering trauma of torture, imprisonment, and separation, discrimination, and even classification systems or three generation punishment and starvation and etc. Particular political and religious prisoners start treatment inside. I have to say, if I may, uh, and, and I have uh, I haven't experienced uh, political prison camps in North Korea, but the prison I explained was just one of them. How many prisons they already have inside the prisons, labor detention centers, and short and long term and medium on these detainees where they have to be. Uh, I mean, the figures, it's enormous. And also the, the pain of what these people and the family members are going through and how many are being killed today in their on a daily basis and weekly. And honestly, because we have a number of international charters, I often think of this and ha have had asked uh, often um, to those representatives, how are we going to heal all these families' tears and painful scars and torture experience? from both inside and outside scars. This problem have had raised uh, uh, many times, not just for North Korean case, but in other countries and inflicted war uh, and conflict and prosecution. And also would North Korean leaders ever think of this cost of reparation for these families tears and suffering? Every single word, I mean, vocabulary we refer to at this event and all any other North Korean human right, uh, rights advocacy group speak of North Korean victims. I really want to uh, address this. They must not forget the inside and outside scars of North Korean people carry on with their daily lives. This was what the UN Commission of Inquiry report on DPRK. Uh, we all know this report and concludes that the 20th century's Holocaust repeat in North Korea as the human rights violations make a state without parallel in the contemporary world. What words I have more to ask for you, particularly international community members and, and groups and activists, and today is, uh, please continue to take stand uh, together in, in, in solidarity and speak and act upon our constitutional rule of law and values of human rights, freedom, expression, and justice. We know that uh, and some, some part of this must not hesitate to keep up the good work on our part, each of we perhaps carry on and, and speak on their behalf and helping those who are in a struggle for freedom and justice, don't even know who they are, what kind of freedom they can have sometimes. This is what, so one of the um, uh, uh, and political and human rights activist once mentioned this. His name was Edmund Burke, I think we all know. And he once said the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is that good man to do nothing. And I, because of <laughs> we have a lack of time here, and I'm going to uh, conclude with a uh, summons and poem actually, and who, the name is Commander Kajori, who was born in Iran and now lives in the UK but we all know what's happening both Iran and North Korea or in other countries. And she, her, her, her poem and called My Silence Speaks. The silence of the hidden and forgotten, the silence of the abused and tortured, the silence of the persecuted and imprisoned, the silence of the hanged and mascared, loud as all the sounds can be, let my silence be loud, so the hungry may eat my words, and the poor may wear my words. And loud as all the sounds can be, let my silence be loud, so I may resurrect the dead and give voice to the oppressed. Thank you. Thank you, Timothy. Now we yield the floor to Dr. Nuas Fels. First of all, hello. Uh, thank you to Korea Future for inviting me. And thank you very much for the words of Hyunsin Lee, her, her very important report. And Timothy for sharing your own story and some very strong 
and very moving reflections with us. Thank you so much. Uh, I will speak to you today, both based from my own experience as an NGO activist, working with helpers who are giving help, especially mental health care, to persons who have been exposed to serious human rights, rights violations, in particular sexual violence and, and gender-based violence and torture. But I will also speak to you as, uh, as, uh, as a treaty body member in the UN, having worked in, in international connections and in the UN with the prevention of torture, first of all, in the Committee Against Torture, and now presently with the Subcommittee on Prevention of Torture, working internationally or globally to prevent torture and ill treatment. I will want to share my screen with you, and some of, the, some of these points have been raised already, but we do know that these are extremely important for us to remember, in particular, how we can engage, and also, as Timothy mentioned, how we can strengthen the international work, the, the, the responsibility of international society and the states to be able to fight against torture and ill-treatment all over, and as we're talking about today in North Korea. As mentioned, the, 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 for, the prohibition against torture is total. It's absolute, and freedom from torture is also a non-derogable right. It's very, it's very clear that there's no circumstances whatsoever that can justify the use of torture. And uh, as we know already, the, the, the absolute right not to be subjected to torture has been pronounced in a number of very difficult different and important covenants and conventions. And the Convention Against Torture is perhaps the most important one or is the one that, that fully deals only with torture and not only the prevention of torture, but also, as I will be mentioning, the right to, re to rehabilitation, the right to redress, the need to criminalize torture, to really investigate torture, to protect people who are reporting torture, all of these rights uh, are enshrined in this convention. And as of today, there are 171 states that have uh, ratified the Convention Against Torture. So what is torture? It is the intended infliction of severe pain and suffering. And it's important to mention, especially with the words of Timothy, talking about the inside wounds and the outside wounds and scars, we're speaking about suffering of mental and physical character and with a purpose. Torture can be found in places of detention, but we see also far too often that there are also torture outside of such places. We know that houses are being raided, people are being visited by police or others, and they may be exposed to torture also in their own, in their own houses. We are, usually when we speak about torture, we speak primarily about the persons in official capacities, but we also speak of, of uh, non-state uh, non actors, persons who are not directly public officials themselves, but they are enforcing upon people torture, pain and ill treatment, often with the knowledge of the public officials or with the acquiescence, as the definition says. But also, we must remember that, that the state has an obligation to prevent and to protect and to prosecute torture. So in situations where non-state act, non actors are, are torturing or, or inflicting serious pain, and the state does nothing, this is uh, also referring to Timothy's point, no good good states or good men do nothing. We're speaking about torture and about serious violations of the convention. As we have seen very clearly already, torture can take many different forms, uh, as described very well in the presentation by Huan Sim, and also the underlining of the psychological pain, the different forms of threats, confusions, sleep deprivation, and non-touch torture. And I think many who have experienced these forms of torture may in the aftermath see that, say that, and I have been working clinically with torture victims for 40 years as a psychologist, and people will say, well, the beatings were terrible, but what happened, the, the, the humiliation, the sleep deprivation, the threats and the confusions, they are the ones who stick to my mind and who come back in flashbacks and in, in painful memories. And of course, we have different forms of sexual and gender-based violence, 
also sexual and gender-based violence in conflicts, something that my organization is working very strongly against. So torture is, it is a way of saying that it's the breaking down of bodies and mind through extreme humiliation, exposure, exposure to severe pain, total loss of control and extreme fear. And I want to underline the brutal attack on dignity and integrity of the person. And also thinking about torture as a way of trying to take apart the values and the good ideas of the person, something which is probably even clearer when we're speaking about torture for reasons of religion or for reasons of beliefs. Torture does create fear, helplessness, and shame. It doesn't have to last forever. But those people who are exposed in the moment, and we can imagine from the experience, from the examples already presented, the feeling of being humiliated and being completely powerless is very, very strong. Also, the feeling of being unworthy and, and shameful. Nobody's there to protect you, and there's nowhere to turn. It's also fear that all your skills are gone, and some people will, after torture, need a lot of time to recreate or to reestablish the idea that I have not become neither stupid nor crazy, but I need to rebuild my own capacity and my own skills, and that's often one of the big challenges one faces as a helper, as I have done for many years myself. And of course, the deep mistrust and anxiety that too many people experience in the aftermath of this. So what are the rights of victims of torture? And of course, this is an, an enormous theme that has to be very briefly touched upon. But I would say that, first of all, the right of everybody is to be protected from torture, whether you have been exposed to torture before or not. But for, if you have been exposed to torture or ill treatment, if you are considered a, a victim of torture, and we must remember that that also includes family members of victims of torture, again, relating to what Timothy said about the importance to, to think about the families. There is the right to reparation, all forms of reparation, in particular, the right to rehabilitation, which means that torture does not cure itself. You need rehabilitation, you need redress, which also includes justice, and the state has an obligation to provide this. The Convention Against Torture defines very clearly that the right or the obligation of states to provide redress is, is a very clear one, and that this shall also include the right to rehabilitation. So Article 14 says exactly this, this sentence, and that, and that is, of course, a brief sentence and a very short article. And we have, in the Torture Committee, worked for many years to have states say something more about what is the rehabilitation system that they provide, how are they actually uh, providing redress. And we experienced so many times that that did not happen or the, uh, what they could explain was very limited. So a general comment number three was adopted in 2012, uh, underlying the need for the great variety of redress and rehabilitation, including or representing the obligations of the state to provide to victims of torture and ill treatment. So one of the important aspects of this Article 14 and what has been described in the general comment number three, which I, which I actually encourage you all to read, you can find it on the web page of the UN, and you have the reference in my, in my PowerPoints here. Rehabilitation is something that must be ensured, and the effective rehabilitation programs is something which has to be provided to people without discrimination, and it has to be it has to be multi-professional and it has to be a long-term uh, pr procedure. So what is rehabilitation? It's first of all to provide a person with safety because no one can be cured or get rid of their nightmares in a situation where they still feel in insecure. They need to re-establish relationships and confidence to other people. That goes for he from health personnel to your own family or to people in general, let alone authorities. Assistance for bodily pain and the need for physical training is often very important. If you have been beaten, been hung, been exposed to electricity, you may need physical assistance to be able to recuperate your bodily pain. But you also need to work with the psychological pain, with the memory, the sleep, and the shame. And when I mention shame here, it's not because any torture victims has anything to be shamed about by all means, but for some very strange psychological reason, people feel all shameful even when 
when the, the humiliation has been forced forcefully exposed to them, which is one of the intricate non-touch uh, torture functions in or touch, uh, torture ways in a way. Also, you need to regain memory and cognitive functions. People who have been tortured are often very unconcentrated. They have difficulties in remembering, in learning new, and this is something that has to be worked with. Also, you have to try to believe in your own activities, your role and capacities, something which can be taken away from you, as I've mentioned already. And you need assistance to be able, again, to be part of a social, social life and reintegrate into society. I want to point at something very briefly, which is very important in this work. And I think that, uh, to, that uh, Korea Future is looking upon this already. It's the need to document and assess torture. And we, have, we, we often speak about the need to document whether there are allegations of torture, also as part of investigations in context of rehabilitation and compensation, and also in asylum procedures. It is important to try to document what has happened, how can we prove, how can we provide an assessment and a documentation of what has happened. And the gold standard internationally for this is what is called the Istanbul Protocol. And I can tell you all that this manual, which was uh, which was first published in 1999 and became a UN document in 2004, is now being re um, is now being republished and updated, and it's quite as big, and it's a lot bigger than it used to be. So in January, February, hopefully, you can start looking for the update of the Istanbul Protocol. So. Having said these things about the, 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 the need to, to both to document, to establish, and to provide training and redress, the, the gender-based violence training model that, mental, that we have developed in our association, MHHRI, tries to say something of two helpers about what is useful in support. And this, this is not only linked to, to gender-based and sexual violence, but can be used by persons working with traumatized and tortured persons in general, which can also be this web page with a lot of information on health and human rights. And so with these words very quickly showing the breadth of this, this, this serious and very violent theme, I hope also to encourage you to work with as, as helpers, as, as, uh, as service providers, and also to use the existing material to help support persons who have been exposed to torture and ill treatment. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor. And now we yield the floor to Dr. Molina. Um, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I was, um, I will also have a PowerPoint and I'm going to share it with you right now. Um, bear with me. Um, I hope you, you can see it right now. Um, so I'm, I'm going through. So um, indeed, um, um, thank you to everybody who talked before me. Um, I actually um, found all your interventions um, um, interesting and moving and also very complete when it comes to already having identified the international framework. So I, I'll try not to really repeat uh, what was very eloquently said. Um, in fact, today um, I was asked to um, reflect together um, on what can the role of civil society be uh, to raise awareness uh, on, on the topic of torture and on these instances that we're discussing, and also to reflect on how to, 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 to foster or to advance accountability. Um, which I'm very honored to do uh, for what I can. Um, before, maybe I just wanted to say that a few words about um, uh, my organization. Um, uh, as uh, it was said at the beginning, I work um, for a research institute based in Vienna, which is called the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute of Fundamental and Human Rights. Uh, and we focus on the prevention of torture and ill treatment. 
um, and um, we have um, focused on, um, well, we have supported um, back um, in 2004, um, the mandate of the UN Special Rapporteur, Manfred Novak, who was previously our scientific director. And then since then, we have kept on focusing on the issue in several research projects. Um, um, in 2019, we have also published a comprehensive legal commentary on the UN Convention Against Torture and its optional protocol. But at bottom line, we, we do uh, explore what measures and mechanisms can be effective in the prevention of torture and ill-treatment. Um, we also are interested in uh, something that is called translational research, um, meaning that um, we, we, we aim or are committed to always create a bridge between research and practitioners, research and the people who are working on the ground, both to disseminate our results, but also to hear what are the real problems and then feed them back in, in our work. So I'm very happy to, to be here with you today. Um, also, I mean, several um, years ago, when I started actually working here at, at this institute, I remember researchers uh, in my team had the chance to focus on human rights challenges in the Korean Peninsula in North Korea, and um, um, and, um, uh, and it, it was back in 2014. So I, I remember when I joined the team um, discussing about the the report of uh, the, the groundbreaking wor work as well of the UN Commission of Inquiry, etc. Um, and so all of this this work um, resonated to, with me um, a lot when you asked uh, me about uh, when when Korea Future asked me about intervening because I remember back then uh, the words of the commissioner um, saying now we cannot say that we do not know uh, about the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and now we all know and there is no excuse. And so I think um, um, I, I'm, um, I'm, in a way, this resonated even more strongly with me. Um, and um, well, there's uh, many initiatives uh, that have been taking place also at the UN uh, since today. Uh, and somehow um, uh, the, the work with the documentation and towards accountability is also something um, done at the official level, obviously, uh, but what, what can be the additional role of a civil society? What, what can we do as civil society organizations? And obviously, civil society can and, and should contribute as much as possible in the official efforts of providing information to um, as well to, to the UN and anyone who is investigating to the topic, but I think um, somehow what is crucial is that, uh, that your work, in fact, is to continuously also advocate for improvement and to keep high the attention on, on this topic. So I really commend this, this workshop, this webinar today um, as well. Um, I think there's obviously no right or wrong approach when it comes to, 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 to civil society's role. And I wanted to share with you something that um, the experiences from a project that we do have in our team, which is called the Atlas of Torture, uh, um, um, and that can be uh, something uh, that linked, of course, um, to, um, to, to giving resonance, so to say, also to, to the work that you do. Um, and um, well, um, the Atlas of Torture is a website that is run by our organization uh, together um, with Uridox, who is uh, um, an information and technology NGO that helps in documenting, um, um, in, in setting up a documentation platform. And why we set it up is because we uh, thought that it's uh, really important to continue raise awareness on the problem of torture and ill treatment and that, well, as, as a research organization, what we can do is, um, in fact, give visibility to, to reports, to documentation, uh, to learning material that, that have been published that, that may be useful for others, um, to give easy access to, to this information, um, because that can be useful for further research, to build 
um, further research, but also for advocacy purposes. And also what we um, aim, uh, so to say, with our project is to offer a platform for cooperation to really um, connect um, with other actors and uh, perhaps form coalition at the level of civil society to, to prevent torture and ill treatment. So overall, um, to prevent um, this um, uh, inhuman uh, treatment. And uh, well, uh, what, um, what do we cover? What is exactly, what are the key components? And I think we do have um, um, relevant publications uh, saved. So we do not collect instances or testimonies that our aim is uh, different as it can be um, um, for other organizations, but we do give Give visibility to this material that is already published and or that we publish or the others publish to disseminate further. We also publish their international um, uh, legal um, uh, framework, so you can cut your um, uh, decisions, concluding observations that, and these are sorted um, uh, uh, following different topics so that can be easily accessed. Um, we also have more practical guidance or, that have been published on how to, uh, in fact, monitor or investigate or uh, pursue legal reforms. Um, what the, the, the second component is that we give visibility to actors and, and projects so that, and the idea behind this is to really um, 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 give um, um, visibility to the actors who are engaged and to connect them again. Um, and um, the platform also contains learning material, trainings, conferences, discussions, um, and uh, gives the possibility to um, uh, conduct online events. Um, as I said, the project is um, run by us together with Eurotox, but of course, in the meanwhile, we've established some informal cooperation with other civil society that allow or agree to share their material on our website or um, uh, would like to organize um, uh, some events or a project together with us. So um, although we do have obviously um, our own policy, our rules on what is fit to publish there or not, we always look forward uh, to um, this kind of cooperation. Um, and I mean, here, uh, just as an example of what is included in the database. Um, so as I said, like, for example, we do collect systematically giving more information also on the themes and, and uh, the CAT uh, jurisprudence, the SBT, but as well as reports of civil society organization. So we don't have yet uh, Korea's future report, but we would be, of course, um, happy to discuss with the organization, uh, with the organizers of this event later on how uh, this could be done. Um, and also we have uh, video interviews um, 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 with well, international experts, but um, um, also with, with um, uh, well, um, survivors who obviously would want to share with us and are ready to, to share with us um, um, experience. Um, um, and um, on top of that, like the final component that we do is that we, this is kind of the newer part of the project and we do uh, organize, for example, block series um, on specific thematic areas, um, always trying to create synergies between disciplines or acquiring deeper understanding of a problem in a participatory way. Um, well, um, obviously, um, the main lessons learned that perhaps I want to share with you is, of course, that the work you're doing of information gathering is, I believe, key uh, for advancing the prevention of torture. Um, and I also think that coordinating and joining e efforts um, with other civil society organizations can be much beneficial because then it gives you and, and everyone um, working on this a stronger voice um, in promoting human rights. 
I mean, when it comes to accountability, maybe I should also mention that our institute, for example, not my team, but another team recently organized an international conference on international criminal law before domestic courts. And maybe the, the speeches and presentation will be published. So I think this could also be, um, so to say, something interesting um, to look at like really how to pursue then further beyond collecting those information um, but i wanted to to share um an ex a concrete example of how we're we're doing and working together with um, civil society organization um, thank you very much for uh, the attention um, and i give the floor back to And uh, in the interest of time, I believe that we will have to wrap up uh, uh, this webinar. And uh, once again, I would like to thank both the panelists and the members of the audience for joining us for this discussion. And also, I would like to thank, and we would also like to thank Stefanos Alliance International for, uh, <coughs> uh, for sponsoring this uh, wonderful webinar. And uh, for the members of the audience who are, uh, who are trying to obtain copies of the uh, Mr. Cho's story or uh, individual styles of the presentation, I, uh, I suggest that you reach out to the Korea, Korea, Future, <coughs> uh, Korea Future's public contact email address uh, to direct your questions to. Uh, or contact individual members of the panel. Thank you for your attention. And depending on where you're joining us from, good night, good day, or a good morning. <laughs>